Hi, my name is Mary Phipps. I'm the editor at the Weezer Signal American Newspaper, and I'm sitting with Sandy Cooper and talking about the Bee Tree Folk School. Hi. Can I ask, why did you establish a folk school in Weezer? Well, about 20 years ago, Dennis and I were at an alternative healing class in Boise, and we met this uh, gentleman named Jim Nelson, and he was one of the most visionary people I've ever known in my life. I always thought of him as a balloon that needed to be brought back to, to earth because he was just so full of ideas. And, and he had the idea for a, a school where people could come, families could come and, and share different things that they knew, crafts or certain skills, or people could just get together and and learn things. And he called this the Lifelong Learning Center. He just kept envisioning and, and we kind of got caught up in that. And so over the next two or three years that we were around Jim periodically, that was what we, we all just dreamed about, how neat that would be. Um, after that time, Jim moved to the Midwest and we kind of lost touch with him. But I think he pursued that somewhere back in Nebraska, I believe it was. Uh, and since we were really busy at the time, we both were working, I had a business, uh, so we put all that on the back burner. The timing wasn't right, but we felt like eventually it was going to be something that if it was supposed to be, it would, it would happen. And uh, what we didn't know at the time was that this was actually a folk school model that we were looking at. What do you mean when you say folk school model? Well, back in the 1830s in Denmark, a gentleman named uh, Grundy um, had this idea. He was a, one of an amazing, uh, influential person, probably one of the most influential people in, in Danish history. He was a pastor, he was a teacher, a philosopher, a historian, a poet, and a politician. And he looked at the educational system in Denmark at that time, and he felt like things could be done a whole lot better and because basically what they offered there was the learned scholar approach in their universities and what he wanted was an alternative uh, plan where people in the local communities had an opportunity to come together uh, and, and learn all sorts of different things without a, uh, a curriculum that was all um, compulsory and that offered uh, learning without having exams or grading and they wanted them to be practical skills that these people could take back to their communities and actually be more involved in forming uh, the social life there. Um, he also felt that having, uh, I loved what he said and I could really relate to this, he said that he felt like grading uh, and having exams was deadening to the human soul. And when I read that, I immediately remembered how I felt during algebra class when we had an exam. So I have to agree with him there. So that resonated with me. What uh, can people learn when they visit the folk school? Well, we try to offer a whole scope, a very broad scope of learning opportunities and uh, Right now, uh, we have a conversational Spanish class going on. We, we want to focus on music. Um, we've done money management classes, uh, just basic skills, basic living skills, and uh, a focus on rural living skills. We've had uh, an awful lot of people come in from more urban areas that are wanting to live a more rural lifestyle. And so we've been approached by uh, a number of people wanting to learn things like gardening and uh, preserve, preserving their own food and, and raising animals and chickens and, and uh, all the things that, uh, that that entails. And so right now we're, we're just, uh, because of the restrictions that we have, we're, we're keeping classes small and we're being very, very safety conscious there but it gives us time to develop and find out what people really want. We did some surveys uh, 
long before we started this to get, a, get an idea of what people, what, what their priority would be and things they'd like to learn. And we don't limit it to just uh, what you might think of as traditional. Uh, we've done the uh, Financial Peace University classes here a couple of times. Um, but we just try to offer what people want and find somebody that's willing and able to, to teach that. And so we feel like that's the best way to, to serve the community. And it's, uh, it's been really fun to have so many people. It's not just people coming in from out of, out of the area, but local people that want to, want to learn things that maybe have skipped a generation. So it's you know, sewing and that sort of thing. So we'll teach just about anything uh, that's legal that, uh, that, that people want to, to come and teach or, or to, to uh, have offered as a class. So. So we're really anxious to see where this takes us, and it's been a lot of fun. We get to meet a lot of great folks, and it, it's, it's been just, so far it's been a really fun adventure where we can't wait to get to work every day. So I think we're doing the right thing. Hi, my name is Mary Phipps. I'm the editor at the Weezer Signal American newspaper, and I'm sitting here with Dennis Cooper to talk about the Bee Tree Folk School. Hi. Hi. I understand that in, addi in addition to the folk school, you also have a museum. How did that come about for you? Well, it was kind of an accident. Um, a friend of ours, Roderick Emerson Simpson, was a world-class musician and a collector and dare I say hoarder <laughs> um, and when he passed his estate bequeathed 16 collections of various artifacts from around the world to our nonprofit which is called Cooperative Music Incorporated. Some of the collections <clears throat> that we received included rare musical instruments, uh, we have various works of art. Uh, we have carved gourds, which I thought might be kind of weird, but they're absolutely gorgeous. Fiber arts done by his mother, Violet Simpson. A comprehensive library of about 5,000 books, and we're going to add a couple thousand books on how to do things to that library. Antique furniture, an extensive record, tape, and video collection, and Nigerian artifacts, recording studio equipment, and over a thousand 18th century Austrian music manuscripts. So I understand that you are a musician as well. How does that play into your mission with the folk school? Well, for me it fits pretty well. Um, my first public performance on any kind of instrument I was five years old, it was a piano recital, and I should have been terrified and I absolutely loved it. Uh, so I've been a, a performer, composer, and a sound engineer most of my adult life, so having the opportunity to include musical performances and education um, in what we do is pretty exciting. I've recorded and released four instrumental albums uh, featuring the diatonic harmonica of all things. So one of the first things we did was to form harmonica and ukulele clubs for our local community where people ranging in age, I think the youngest was about eight years old and the oldest was 87, get together and learn how to play those instruments in a group setting where the primary emphasis is on having fun. Um, the interaction between the young people and the old people is awesome. Us old people have gotten used to the fact that the nine-year-olds are going to kick our butts musically. They are amazingly fast learners and they, they do an awesome job, but it, it inspires the rest of us to keep trying. Uh, we also host jam sessions, concerts, dances, um, and other events for members of our community. 
uh, one of my primary goals is to get to work translating those Austrian manuscripts we received into modern notation so that we can make those available to musicians and orchestras all over the world. Our community recording studio has kind of allowed several local musicians to share their talents with a broader audience and it allows us to teach sound engineering principles as well. Why would you encourage people to visit the museum and the school? I think they need to come down and take a look and visit and let us know what they want to learn.